Good afternoon and welcome to the first in Cornet uh, Global UK's chapter uh, three-part series on thriving in remote settings. I'm James Pack, uh, Cornet executive member, uh, and in this session we're looking at virtual leadership and are delighted to welcome Major General uh, Tom Coppinger Sims, CBE, Kirk Vallis and Dr. Mark Davis. Uh, and now to our session today. Uh, there has been and will continue to be volumes of content put out into the ethosphere on remote working or work from home. Much but not all of the content is focused on the physical settings, connectivity or hardware or software solutions, um, or debate between the benefits of work from home and workplace settings and the processes for easing peace of mind and mental health. But how can we better socially influence our colleagues and teams to maximize the efforts towards the achievement of a goal? How can we be better leaders in this less connected environment? And should ex expectations of good leadership be exclusive to the seniority or management uh, on this or in any other context? In a less physically connected workplace, how can we maximize the efforts of others towards the achievement of a goal? So to help us uh, explore, I am delighted to welcome uh, uh, to our panel, uh, Dr. Mark Davis, and welcome back to Cornet, uh, Kirk Vallis and Tom Coppinger Sims. Uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction to, to to each, and then we'll sort of crack on. But Kirk's time is is mainly spent as Google's head of creativity development, where he works to close the gap between how we we know we should be uh, or how we should behave at work and how often we do. Uh, he helps Googlers understand what it is about the approach, but vitally the behaviours that teams and individuals exhibit uh, that time and again result in an awesome piece of innovation, a fresh way to solve a problem, or simply positive change. Tom is Director of Military Digitization at UK Strategic Command. He spent his early career on operations with the Royal Green Jackets, now the Rifles, uh, on operations in Northern Ireland, Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan, um, and in operational strategy posts at the Permanent Joint Headquarters and the Ministry of Defence. Uh, last year, he took up his current post, uh, newly created to accelerate the defence's digital transformation and increase its adoption and exploitation of uh, digital technology. He, re he reports to the defence uh, CIO and is the only military officer in the digital in the defense digital senior leadership team so he spends most of his time learning new skills and language mark davis uh, is uh, ibm's chief medical officer for europe the middle east and africa he has over 20 years experience at, as an nhs general practitioner in west yorkshire uh, and has a long-standing interest in informatics health policy and system redesign uh, and this has led him to work nationally for 15 years in a number of clinical leadership roles at the department of health the cabinet office and most recently as the executive medical director of the nhs digital uh, gentlemen uh welcome to to cornet uh, it's lovely to lovely to see you. Um, so, uh, firstly, uh, if I may, can I ask each of you to set out your thoughts on leadership in physical or virtual settings? Um, uh, in your worlds, are there specific behavioural attributes at play, uh, and what are the optimal conditions for flourishing teams and, and leadership? And perhaps we might be able to start with Kirk. Um, I'm glad I get to go before Tom because being being in the military, I'm sure he's got a really profound uh, uh, take on, on on leadership. So I get I get to go first and ramble through a bit briefly. But I um I read the other day there was a really nice article in um, um in, in Forbes magazine and it and it was a brilliant articulation the difference between management and leadership or managing and leading, and it said that you know management is about trying to really sort of get to an answer quickly a straight line if you like sort of getting rid of the complexity making things simple and helping to to get to that answer whereas leadership is actually about sort of embracing the complexity and the ambiguity the 
the VUCA world, uh, to use the acronym that we're often um, exposed to right now, uh, by you know encouraging the off the meandering path that we might take to uh, to get to the answer, knowing that it's going to lead to more 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 impact. So I'll, I'll go with that. I think there's, it's just almost for for me, leadership is about not taking the obvious route, not driving people to just follow the the path that's been trodden before, but actually creating the right conditions for people to try new things, to look at things in different ways, to deliberately inject stimulus and provocation that helps our team to get out of our bubble and our echo chamber, um, all with the knowledge that all of this exposure to, I'll, I'll use a buzz, buzz phrase, cognitive diversity will, will help us to, to get to new and better answers um, time and again. I'll stop there. You might be on mute, James. You might have kindly gone on to mute for, for my benefit. I was on mute. I was on mute for your benefit. Thank you. I was going to ask, sorry, uh, Kate, what are the those the, the optimal conditions or the, the the right conditions in your mind? Oh, right. Well, so and that's the I guess the context that we're in today: virtual leadership or um, you know thriving in a in a remote setting. So. Uh, well, firstly, at Google, we know time and again, high performing teams. Number one attribute of a high performing team is psychological safety. So how do you create psychological um, psychologi psychological safety? I guess that's creating the right physical, mental and emotional setting for everyone to feel like they can bring the best of them themselves. It's interesting. I was on a, a call earlier today and we were sort of talking about the uh, you know, the, the the challenges of the tech world and the virtual interactions that we're having and how we have to be really mindful and deliberate about making sure that everybody feels included and that we're creating a platform where everybody feels like they can be their, their best. But there's also a flip side here is that, let's be honest, we, we were muddling through a little bit before in the non-virtual world. So you could argue that this kind of forced disruption on us. And um, again, I know that Mark and Tom will both talk from their respective worlds about sort of actually the, the positive impact sometimes of forced disruption on us, being forced to look at things a bit differently. But the fact that we're being forced to, to start again means that we're not wedded to the old habits. So actually, you know, uh, one top tip I would always give any leader or manager, whatever we want to express it, express it as right now is, is don't treat how you led in a largely in-person environment as the same as as this virtu as, as the virtual world. You know, they're totally different. And I'm not sure many of us actually stop to think about that. It's a bit like I was trying to think of an analogy or a metaphor, a bit like uh, driving a, the difference between driving a car and riding a motorbike. Right. Essentially, the rules of the road are the same. You know, you're getting from A to B. But technically how you drive a car is totally different to riding a, riding a motorbike and the two are very different so we can't just assume it's the same you know how many of us have really spent time step back and gone on formal or informal training to help us to be even more impactful our virtual presence our our listening ability um a plug for google i'm not here to plug google but at google we've just developed a little um uh, add-on to our Google Meet where it tells you what percentage of the the meeting time you are spent talking. Um, it won't surprise, but but brilliant! What a tool for a leader, um, especially those of us who are maybe a bit prone to 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 dominate in the airwaves. Um, but it's a lovely way, and we've just so we've just been doing some work around that. How do those of us that naturally will dominate the airwaves? How do we dial back? But it's also quite an interesting tool for those of us who might feel like when we, we're a bit more contemplative and we don't we don't maybe volunteer our perspective as much. Can we set ourselves a little personal goal, even if that's to be 20 percent versus the normal 10 that we contribute in the meeting? So it's like, let's use these tools. They're there. It's still a human contact sport. I love that. But technology has been, you know, it's the best ever tool that we've that we've ever had to innovate with in all walks of life. And and this is the same. But they only work if the behaviours are right. And I'm sure we'll probably come back to that at, at another point. But I'll I'll defer to, to the brilliant brains that are on the call at the moment. Brilliant. Thanks, Kirk. Tom, do you want to, to, to add to Kirk's points? Tom? I can see he's blinking. Uh, 
Are you there, Tom? Are you hearing this, mate? James, can I just check you can hear me? I can hear you now, yes. Thanks. Sorry, I'm not getting any of you, but I'm I'm judging by the strange looks that I'm supposed to be on, so I'll, I'll crack on. And if I lose comms, then uh, maybe just put your hands around your ears or something and give me a clue. Um, so, what does a what does a general know about virtual leadership? I guess um, I guess contrary to Hollywood, uh, for those of you who haven't served, leadership in war, and I'll give you a sort of unashamedly army view. Although I, at the moment I work in defence. Leadership in war is very virtual and very remote. Um, it's not good Hollywood because on, on cinema screens, you want everybody on the screen and it looks a lot better that way. But actually in war, you tend to spend most of your time getting away from each other. So you can't all get killed by the same artillery round or mortar round or even bullet. Um, and you spend a lot of time actually leading and following very remote from either your followers or your leaders. Uh, I mean, to such an extent that we've, we've created a whole command philosophy around what we call mission command. And uh, I won't bore you with all the details of this, but, but battle is always about seizing dynamic opportunities and working as part of a much larger organization um, of which you are but a small part. So we have this philosophy mission command, which is the opposite of what we call directive control. So it's the antithesis of telling people exactly what to do and, and where, and instead, it's telling them what the overall organization needs to achieve and then letting them get on and play their part in it with the minimal interference from their boss that you can manage. Uh, now, clearly, you spoke about behaviors and culture, James. That relies on a huge amount of trust. It relies on a huge amount of mutual understanding. It relies on common doctrine, sort of common understanding of how you fight together. Um, and it requires a lot of trust and a certain amount of obedience but also the ability to not disobey, but within an overall obedient framework to alter what your boss told you if the situation changes. Because like in any world, the, the, the sort of battle is a very dynamic situation and uh, the, the situation changes the whole time and therefore the orders you might have been given go out of date very quickly. So that's the sort of why we might have something to say about virtual leadership. And, you know, if, if you look at um, the battle group I had the privilege of commanding in Afghanistan, that was, it, it, frankly, COVID feels very much like that. I very rarely saw my subordinate, me and my de direct reports in civilian terms. Every evening we had a radio conference, including with my Afghan partners. So you're working through interpreters at this stage um, across large swathes of land, uh, across the airwaves which felt, albeit without video, very much like what we're trying to do today, complete with um, some suboptimal audio and not quite being sure if anybody can hear you at any one time. Um, so we've done an awful lot of this. Uh, and I guess after um, months of COVID, people, think, people are starting to think, well, what's so special about that? What I wanted to bring out, though, was how leading in the virtual world relies on what you've done in the physical world beforehand um, and how you build that trust that sense of common endeavor and that particularly that knowing your people in the physical world before you then have to work virtually uh, i think this is what will all make us think far more carefully in the future about why we come together in the physical world and what we do when we're there because i think ever more we're realizing that you need to use those moments of physical intimacy closeness to understand each other and know, you know, going back to what Kirk said, um, what are those silences? When somebody's talking too much, is that because they're really enthusiastic or is it because they're actually very nervous? When somebody's being quiet, is that a passive aggressive silence or does that mean they don't know what the answer is? Um, and, and really knowing people is a, is a vital enabler to working, leading, following remotely and virtually. So I think that's the first thing I'd highlight is the value of the physical in enabling the virtual. And I do think that should influence what we what we do every day um, and why we do come together, you know, whether it's for the offsite or the conference or whatever else um, and how it will unleash us to then work virtually or remotely so much, um, so much more. Um, central to all of this is, is something very dear to my heart, what I call delegating to the point of discomfort. 
delegating to the point of discomfort and the sense that if you aren't a little bit nervous by the level of delegation you've empowered your people with, if you aren't worrying a little bit that you've gone too far, you haven't gone far enough. Uh, and of course, as Buzz Lightyear would say, you could you could even extend it to delegate to the point of discomfort and beyond, which is what I've always tried to do. And again, the importance, especially if you're doing that virtually, especially if you can't look your subordinate in the eye when you're delegating that huge freedom, understanding when they need a virtual cuddle, a virtual arm around the shoulder, when they do need a little bit more explanation of what the task is and what its purpose is, is absolutely critical. I think the, the last thing I point to at this stage is the importance of resilience in this. And, you know, I think lots of people have found in COVID, whether it's the lack of work-life balance or just the inability to have a real g &T with your mates or come together and chat, you know, life can be lonely sometimes. And it does call for a totally different level of resilience when you can't come together and get that sort of moral group cohesion uh, from all being in the same room. And again, this is something very familiar to us um, as soldiers. You know, we always say leadership is a very lonely business, especially in battle, uh, not least because it's very hard to show any weakness to your soldiers because you, you feel that you've got to be on top of everything. Um, and it's doubly important that you can reach out across the airwaves or the video waves and recognize when somebody does need a bit more support than they would otherwise have um, to give them that resilience, but also to build that resilience in training. So I think I'll stop there um, for the moment and we can we can address other issues and questions, James. Thank you, Tom. Can I just check, Tom, when you can hear me? You can hear me. Oh, brilliant. OK. That, that, thanks, Tom. That was, uh, that was really, really interesting. Um, Mark, can I bring you in at this, uh, at this stage uh, just to, and I, I was rather hoping you might just be able to reflect on some of the, the, the points that uh, that both Kirk and Tom have, that have mentioned. Yeah. In terms of how that relates to your role specifically and what you're tasked with trying to achieve within IBM, but also perhaps with a, a sort of broader NHS practitioner sort of point of view, particularly perhaps, you know, with a, a, a look back to the last sort of couple of months and, and, and the pandemic and the pandemic as well. Yeah, no, for, for sure. I'd be happy to do that. And, and I think I'm demonstrating one of the challenges of remote working. There I go again by, uh, by the, <laughs> the quality of my bandwidth. So I apologize. I keep popping in and out of uh, video, but um, hey, hey, ho. Um, so, 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 yeah, so just talking from a, from a kind of healthcare perspective in, in initially, um, you know, clearly healthcare broadly has been asked to step up and, and, and we have seen, I, I think we would all acknowledge levels of, of, of personal and professional commitment from, um, uh, frontline health and indeed social care um uh, professionals as they as, as they as they fight this virus and and a, a lot of that is un, underpinned by 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 leadership um at a at a at a small team level and at a at a, at a broad, broader level what's really interesting about this and what's kind of come to light is this issue around around styles of leadership um, so, so there are different styles required, obviously, for for the running of things uh, than there are uh, in in a in a crisis. Something that um, that Tom has Tom has talked about, and in, in in healthcare, frankly, we have at scale been 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 learning. Um, and and it strikes me that kind of some of the lessons around kind of that crisis style style leadership has been has been you know number one the the the, the, the preeminence importance of providing uh, a calmness and a confidence for teams to be able to hang on not in a kind of artificial generated way but in a, in, a, in an authentic way um, to 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 kind of help people navigate their own kind of emotional turmoil as they go through you know very um, unprecedented and stressful times on on all sorts of things. I think the other role that I've seen, which has been really important, has been what I might call sense making. Um, you know, just 
taking the kind of really confused, dare I even say it, Tom, the fog of war that we've had to deal with in terms of the science, the evidence surrounding uh, a, a new virus and indeed a new disease has been incredibly stressful for people professionally and, and, and personally. So, the, so, the, so constant communication to avoid the vacuum where kind of rumor and false information can emanate is a, is a, is a, is a, is a core cornerstone, I, I think, of successful leadership that we've think, seen through this, this term all time. Uh, and the last one I would probably flag up is, 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 is empathy. That um, I, I think, as Kurt says, we are we are all individuals, and when thrown into different situations, we will all react in in different ways. Some of us, you know, our personal circumstances are different, uh, our personalities are, are 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 different, and our emotional state is different. And and it is to be expected in a in a diverse and rich group of people who we are expected to work with that they will react in a, in in different ways. So an understanding and dare I even say it a kind to that attitude whereby you acknowledge that people will react in 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 different ways and and I think Tom you talked about this um, that taking the time to check out and actively make sure that people are okay and and to create a culture where it's okay to say you're not okay and you can openly talk about uh, stress anxiety uh, depression in 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 in, uh, in in the workplace during during un uncertain times. I guess I guess the, the 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 last thing that I would just just reflect on is is that um, it's something of a cliche that that the role of leadership isn't limited to whoever's in charge, uh, and that everyone has a uh, has a role um, uh, uh, in in uh, uh, in a leadership t in a leadership team. And and I think this virtual world that we've all been been thrown into has been the Exem an, an exemplar of the importance of, of that. And certainly in the teams that I've worked with in healthcare or indeed that I've seen in, in, uh, in IBM, we, we have seen individuals step up and take on those kind of leadership characteristics that I've just been, been describing, irrespective indeed of where they are in, in, in a management, uh, management structure. So I think they're the, I think they're the key, the key, the key themes that have come out, come out for, for, for me. They are, um, things that I suspect all of us know, but in the last six months, what's happened is we have become viscerally aware of it and had, and had to put them into, into practice. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I mean, that makes uh, sort of perfect sense. Um, and actually, speaking of sort of perfect sense in the sense making in the fog of war, I'm reminded of, a, of something that happened to me uh, a few years back when I was uh, when I was serving uh, in the military. Um, uh, uh, my company commander, who is currently a very senior general in the forces, came up to me and said that he was surprised to hear that my riflemen said that they would follow me anywhere. And uh, I was equally surprised. Uh, and when he saw the look on my face, he goes, uh, yes, James, I thought that as well. But they then did add that they'd follow you anywhere purely out of curiosity. <laughs> so, um, and uh, I think that's been the story of my life uh, ever since. Ba -bum but, ba -bum <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I'm here every Tuesday. Um, coming back to the... I, I, Tell you what I, I thought was quite interesting there, the, and it was a theme that ran through both what Kirk said, Tom said, and and yourself, Mark. There it was around these 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 moments of these these moments of intimacy, these times when we are sort of physically physically connected. The world is full of a moment of you know pol uh, uh, sort of policy statements from government, from businesses, from corporations, all trying to encourage people you know, sort of people back. Uh, on the suggestion that they, you know, that they want teams to, you know, to be back in their office where they can do their work just as well. Are we suggesting, perhaps, that these times when people are back, are those times that we should spend team building uh, and perhaps not necessarily doing everything that's associated with doing their their day to day their day to day work? And, and if that was the case, what uh, and if it isn't necessarily in the physical work environment? What might be some of the suggestions or ideas that people might could consider that might be outside of a, in a, a conventional work setting? Kirk, do you want to start off? Uh, I'll, um, I'll I'll definitely start. I I mean I'm I've taken what Tom said about that that need to 
you kind of fuel up if you like when you're in person to to power the the time that you're apart i, I just think that's that's brilliant and so so true um and it's interesting i do some work with james you and i came together through my work with um england rugby and i work with the england football team as well and and lots of head coaches in some of the elite teams in the in the higher leagues They've been now, it's a really hierarchical world and one that's really formal relationship between leader and, and, and reports, if you like, or team and, and gaffer, as they, as they call it. And, um, and they've been blown away by a simple learn, which is to have, for example, a, um, a WhatsApp group. So previously, a lot of teams, especially in football, there'd be a WhatsApp group between the players, but the manager wouldn't be on it because that was just not the done thing. And during lockdown, almost forced themselves to go on it because it was a way to connect. And, and just the power of that, they've all, when, I, when I've had feedback from lots of different leaders in, in elite sport around the, one of the biggest things and some colleagues at Google, actually, they've all sort of said just the simple things like that, that they previously had just dismissed as being, as being relevant. So, I mean, I, I really love that. So don't underestimate if you're sitting there right now thinking, what can I do to kind of get that int intimacy, to, to feel that fuel tank? Don't underestimate just some of the stuff you do with your friends or the, um, that kind of everyday stuff. I think the working environment is going to be really interesting. I've spent years asking people where they do their best work and no one ever say at the office. Um, and But I actually think now that that could be balanced. This room, which I used to love coming into, I've got to be honest, I hate it now. I hate it in my home. I'm not working from home. I'm living at work. And and this doesn't feel like a creative space for me anymore. Um, my inbox might be quite small, um, but I don't feel like I'm challenging the status quo. I'm, um, so really interesting as we go back to work at places like Google, and I'm sure IBM will be the, be, be the same. I really hope that we kind of my, my advice would be don't don't do the desk space, you know, to, to are actually just to concur with your point, James, the, the desk. We've got these desks at home and we're cracking on here. So make sure that when we go into the office, those of you that are responsible for creating the physical space inside our buildings, then actually it should all be about collaboration now. And I know that we've often in the past we've created those spaces and sat there and gone. Uh, is this a lot of money that's not really being used because everyone's just at their desk, you know, cracking on with their headphones on. But now it's all those environments. So accelerate that. I used to say, go to work with your to-do list, go home with your to-think-about list. My challenge, I think it's actually, in, you know, it, um, it's got the opportunity to flip a bit more now. We'll go to work to bounce things around. We might not get an output. Don't go with an agenda. Get some diverse perspective on stuff you're working on and then bring it back get reductive and sort of make sense of it and get your, get your output done, if you like. So loads of, you know, interesting things, I think, that we're, we've got the opportunity to embrace. Brilliant, thanks. Tom, the, the, I mean, the, the forces you know, have, have, have long held, a, uh, have undertaken huge amounts of team building for us, whether that's through sport, through adventure, you know, for adventure training. Um, and a lot of people often used to, you know, you often used to comment on it was, on it was a, you know, it was a, a bit of a DOS. Um, but uh, I think they were forgiven that, uh, you know, obviously during the times of the, you know, the uh, in, in Iraq and, uh, and the war in Afghanistan as well. But it has, has and I, I, I know the answer to this, but it has sent, you know, set it, there's a, a real genuine reason for this and also the reason why people train so hard in peace stuff. Yeah, so I hope you can hear me again now. Um, I, I mean, your mention of adventure training is great. And, you know, what, what I think in civilian life is known as team building. And it doesn't all have to be climbing mountains or canoeing down rivers. It can be slightly more sedentary. But anything that takes you out of, out of your comfort zone gets everybody into, funnily enough, a place of psychological safety because they're not expected to be performing in that area making a mess of it doesn't matter you know they can relax uh, i think it's really important for that team building i would just say i mean one of the one of the things i've loved about or that i loved about lockdown was um being able to do much more fizz than i've been able to do for 15 years so i mean quite literally you know i haven't had this much time to go running or cycling or work out in the garden than i have for yeah nearly nearly two decades and for me that that does help with the waistline but actually, primarily, it helps with my own head space. 
and my chance to process what's going on at work. And unashamedly, I think about work when I'm when I'm running or cycling. And as a leader and as a follower, you know, I get a lot of my I'm not going to say they're bright ideas, but I get a lot of clarity when I'm when I'm doing physical um, uh, fitness. So I think both for team and individual, um, I hope one of the things that comes out of this time is that reawakening of you know what the physical does for us as we've all been discussing i was just going to mention a couple of other sort of counterintuitive things which you know don't necessarily lead on from where we were but it just occurred to me when kirk was talking humor is really interesting um you know in the military we've used humor an awful lot and i guess when it's taken to an extreme that becomes sort of banter into bullying if if we get it wrong but humor is really important to us one of the things I've noticed about video conferencing and webinars is humor does not travel very well across screens. And the flattening effect, that wasn't a jibe at your joke earlier. <laughs> I'm just but, about to ask. Cheers, mate. But it's, it's, it's just plain different. <laughs> and, you know, humor is really important to us as, as sort of social groups. But it's different over telly, as I'm sure any stand up comedian would be able to tell you from from sort of doing it in a bar um, at, at midnight to doing it you know, to millions of people on telly. And I think how we deploy humor, um, we probably need to think really quite carefully about because, you know, humor usually has a but, you know, a but of the joke, which is quite the opposite. And if if somebody's already on their own and they're but, the butt of the joke that might make them feel even less part of the team than if they were in the room and, and feeling part of the team. So I think that, that was just something that occurred to me when Kurt was talking about intimacy there, for whatever reason. We, we need to think very carefully how we deploy humour in building teams. And then I, I was just going to mention one other thing, that um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't imagine that we're all the same and that building teams physically is the only way. And one of the things I've noticed with some of my team, I'm not, not a technologist, but some of my technologists are very introverted and aren't that comfortable talking in, in large groups. But I've noticed they find the IM, the, the instant messenger, very, very effective. So they contribute on video conferences um, far more enthusiastically they, than they would if we were in a physical room together because they can tap away and there's a sort of, there's a parallel conversation going on. I, and sometimes then there's a WhatsApp group and so on as well. We, we all know that feeling. And I'm guessing the four of us here today are pretty happy with the use of the old mouth as a, as a communication tool. But we shouldn't imagine that everybody is. And I think, you know, recognizing that some people communicate better in virtual environments is, is really important. And there's just a huge opportunity to build creativity from others who might feel less comfortable in the physical world. So just some additional thoughts there. Brilliant. Actually, with that instant messaging, and before I bring um, Mark back in, uh, could I just say to everyone who is tuned in that uh, please feel free to ask any questions uh, by going to the chat uh, the, to the chat column. Uh, we've still got you know, twenty or so minutes uh, minutes left, and I know for a fact that uh, uh, the, the three panelists can keep going for quite a long time. Uh, so, uh, but we'd love to answer any any other questions. So please feel free to do that. Um, but with those things, it, it, occurs, it occurs to me that there are, funny enough, quite a few similarities, I think, between how the, 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 the military and the services and healthcare professionals you know, approach, you know, approach leadership, uh, whether that's through humour, sport, or, 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 or whatever um, they, they, might, they might be. Uh, and I was just wondering from your point of view, and perhaps thinking back to your earlier, your earlier career, what, how, how, you, how, how you found that and how you responded to it. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's a really, it's a really interesting su subject, how similar actually um, uh, some of the behaviours you, you see in healthcare are to, to, to the military, particularly in very high stress, um, life and death, fast moving situations. Um, I, I think one of, one of the things I would just kind of reflect on is, is and we've all talked about building the uh, capital of a team. So getting to know people, getting people to connect, uh, not particularly about work, but on a, on a personal level and getting to know each other um, uh, in, in a way that, you know, when you know someone's children or you know the name of someone's 
partner in in life it it, it makes the the the, the crises hard, uh, easier to manage together so 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 i think that's that's that goes without saying so that's, that's an important um, an important element of a highly functioning team but equally important is 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 coming together not so much before the event but after the event so so it's quite common in healthcare practice to have you know critical critical event reviews where you know perhaps where things have not gone uh, ideally or perhaps they've had tragic consequences and a group of professionals come together to analyze and take what learning they can from what's what's happened but also support each other and, and acknowledge uh, the emotional uh, difficulties of what they, they have gone through and how you do that in a virtual way uh, just requires a little bit of thought. You know, I think we can't assume that uh, we'll have um, an event, you know, a sort of event um, uh, uh, that will happen that's quite challenging, that people will come together on a, you know, Zoom platform or, uh, sorry, sorry, a Teams platform or something else, and, uh, and it will be the same because it won't be. Um, it, 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 is, it, is, it is critical to do that, that, that to be disciplined in making that check that step of checking out um, how people how people are responding to the to the kind of support they're getting and whether they want more or whether they want it in a in a different way. Um, I, I'm really struck by I chair a a global chief medical officer um, network. So this is a a network of chief medical officers and chief health officers uh, for some of the largest companies in in the world, and and those we we as a network we would would meet um, a few times a year, and 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 when COVID hit, um, essentially these 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 professionals um, uh, weren't exactly the most important people in the organisations, and and kind of almost overnight uh, the sustainability of their companies and in fact the sustainability of their industries in some case if you think about the airlines industry um, focused on the spotlight focused on these individuals and their analysis of the science and the advice that they were getting and honestly as as a group they have been coming together uh, every two weeks so so large numbers of senior people have just coming together um, uh, they also use uh, they also use um, uh, uh, whatsapp but they come together on a virtual platform in order to just share professional experiences to support each other to be community of practice and provide a network for um, them to learn um, from from each other and I, I you know I, I, I don't think I can emphasize how valuable that has been uh, for them in 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 managing a period of of, of, of enormous enormous uncertainty one one of the things that um that i'm keen on and and uh, uh it wasn't wasn't my idea it was the uh, an idea that came out of a relatively junior member of my team in ibm was was the introduction of um a coffee bingo so so people are um allocated randomly another member of the tart team and they um, once a week, just take 15 minutes out to have a non-work conversation with someone you're ra randomly allocated to. It sounds a bit crazy, and it's a bit it's 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 a bit light-hearted. But but I but I know that people have um, benefited enormously from just being able to connect, being given permission to connect um, to to someone not about a subject around work, and just to colour in the, the humanity. Uh, of of the people we work with, rather than just thinking about to do lists. That's uh, I mean uh, uh, that's uh, I think quite uh, quite key in, uh, in in my from my personal point of view, Mark. But uh, can I? I'm just going to draw to it. We've got some really good questions that have come in here. Uh, and uh, and the first that I wanted to sort of pick up on, and let's just draw this one back to you, Tom. Um, in, in, when it comes to delegating to the point of discomfort, how do you uh, ensure that you avoid disaster, and how do you ensure that actions are taken that need to be taken? So I, I spoke about the the sort of mutual trust and and shared understanding and common doctrine. So that's part of it. Uh, but I think, if I'm honest, you can't. Um, and implicit in delegation has to be the sense that whilst you can delegate the responsibility for carrying out a task within a, your over, overall intent, you, you cannot abrogate the responsibility if that task then goes wrong. 
And that's why it's uncomfortable. So you can't fully mitigate the chance of something going badly wrong. Now, of course, you know, a principle of military life is you always have a reserve and the reserve should be big enough to be able to offset, you know, a single part of your battle going wrong so that you can throw another platoon or company or battalion into the attack or, or whatever else it is. So, of course, we manage risk like anywhere else. But I think it's it's pretty central to the idea of delegating to the point of discomfort and beyond that it could go horribly wrong. And that you then have to underwrite your subordinates errors. Um, and I say that in the sure knowledge that my bosses over the years have underwritten my errors repeatedly. And uh, I've had a pretty stiff um, going over uh, about them, but I've lived to fight another day. And I'd, I'd like to think it's for others to judge that I've learned from all those mistakes. So I think to your question, there is no absolute way and that's why it's uncomfortable but unless your subordinates know that you've got their back they you won't be able to unleash their creativity you won't get them into a place where they're happy to think about delivering what you want but in a in a way that you would never imagine yeah. and i think in a time of both crisis and disruption that's ever more necessary i think you know right now leaders are far more about asking questions than they are providing answers and your subordinates have got to have that sense of psychological safety that kirk spoke to that they can come up with answers that you never expected and you know in a time of disruption we all need subordinates who come up with answers that we never expected but they feel empowered to come up with them and then give them a go uh, and you know that means some of them are going to fail and we've got to underwrite those mistakes, but the whole organization will get better. Sorry for the long winded answer, but it's it's a really, really important point. Um, can I just uh, jump in, James? Uh, apologies for the um, the repetition, but those of you that have um, seen me speak at Cornet before I speak about at Google, we use a term which is to get uncomfortably excited. And um, and it's a purely subjective emotional call. There's no science about it. It's your, your personal call. But it, but it kind of plays to that. I think a lot of us, of course, our negativity bias and our and our need just to sort of stay alive and stay safe means that we're it's an it's a, it's a totally understandable response to um, Tom's provocation about you know uh, dis getting you know delegating to the point of discomfort. Actually, let's if if that feels like a bit extreme for you, um, and hopefully it doesn't feel as much now. Tom's given some some colour to it. Um, go the other end. How are, uh, you know the risk? Actually, there's more risk to you spending every day as a leader feeling not uncomfortable at all and totally in control, and you're not going to get anything new. You know those butterflies in your stomach are a good thing because they're suggesting that you're doing something that you're not 100% sure about. And you know we always use that word excited as our qualification. If you're just uncomfortable, there might be something wrong there. But if you're going, if you're thinking about all the risk, the fact it might fail, the the maybe a little bit of extra work needed to put into getting buy-in, the fact you've got to sell it into senior stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're still going, yeah, but there's something in this, it's often the sweet spot of innovation and um, and creativity. And uh, whilst I've, I've got the mic, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up in a second. But the other expression that we always use, which is, you know, you don't have to be serious to solve serious problems. And it plays to that point, I guess, you know, some of the other questions have kind of played to that. Is it just about productivity and getting stuff done? Or is it about just um or is it going to be more about creativity and so on and and absolutely listen the science of our brain tells us the moment we allow the pressure or the severity of the situation to take hold our ability to have any new ideas or solutions to solve that problem disappear so so again psychological safety it's it's not about just laughing or making little of the situation but what it is about is not allowing the pressure of the situation to dominate your response because it will only ever be fight flight or freeze in that context so again as leaders how do we you know embrace absurd encourage almost demand the absurd ideas i'm sure both mark from the medical there's stories from the medical world and from the military world of where some of the most impactful solutions or cures or drugs have come from the most absurd starter thoughts so we should embrace that more but as leaders create a safe to fail environment yeah tom go on yeah, there was just a, something that Kirk's comments sprung off. But of course, in the military, we have the great privilege, and I, I think in the medical fraternity, they do too. We spend an awful lot of time training. 
Um, I mean, when we're not fighting, we're training. Uh, uh, because, you know, getting it wrong, ultimately, whatever I say about, um, you know, backing people's mistakes, you don't want the whole organization getting it wrong, you can afford individuals getting it wrong. So we spend a lot of time training. And I know that in, in civilian business, that is not a luxury many people can afford, you know, you just can't afford the margin of spare people, spare infrastructure, spare whatever to be training. But again, I think in a time of disruption and crisis, the you know the the premium on training has just changed and we differentiate between training and education but here let's just think of them all the same thing and i you know i really wonder i mean in my job at the moment because i'm a fish out of water you know i'm a i'm an infantryman ended up in defense digital really trying to work out how digital helps us operate and fight i have to spend i'm going to say 20 to 25 percent of my time learning you know and 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 i'd include today this this event as part of that learning you know listening to what mark and kirk are saying from different worlds is firing off a whole bunch of things in my head that is part of that learning and i wonder just because we do have the privilege in the military of all that training and learning and education um i wonder what that's going to mean for all sorts of industries that have never been able to afford the time to train and learn and i think in a time of disruption there's probably got to be far more investment in training and learning than there has been than in a time of status quo. And, you know, maybe our model on that, I think medics are the same. Um, maybe maybe it's something that other people should be thinking about. Yeah, James, I, I completely agree with that. I, 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 I don't know how you've managed this, James, but you've put a panel together of, of people who are fish out of water. I mean, we've, we're all, we've all kind of started in one tribe, discipline, and ended up in a, in a slightly different different uh, industry. And and the, and the reason that training is 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 so important, I guess, in in um, healthcare delivery uh, um, spheres and 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 military spheres is is you will be presented with very complex and novel situations and and the reality is societally personally commercially whatever uh, we have all been presented with this particular novel situation so we have new ways of talking to colleagues new ways of leading new ways of of doing business new ways of of, of managing sales etc and 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 for that reason that the 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 training the the addressing of different ways of thinking about problems using a kind of design mentality um is is, is really critical so so if i can think about what's happening in healthcare we we say in primary care general practice has moved you know whole scale to um large amounts of virtual uh, virtual consultations uh, almost within a matter of days uh, out of necessity we are rapidly moving hospital outpatients uh, to a similar virtual virtual setting and and you know the 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 new ways of thinking about delivering care is not about just getting a, a new bit of technology and slapping it on. It's about the rethinking and the creative ways of, of saying, okay, what, what opportunities does this, does this, does this open up? I, I, if, you, if you don't mind, I'll just give you a, 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 an example, which I think is really, really poignant. So, so COVID comes along, new virus, new disease, um, you know, the, the medical profession had to learn very quickly how to treat this thing, and and it, and it heralded a, a, um, a an approach to doing clinical trials that has never been seen before. So so we created some of the well the largest uh, uh, recovery trial uh, in the world, based out of Oxford University. It was a collaboration between um, uh, a government body, NHS Digital, Oxford University, uh, IBM and Microsoft, and and it set out to have the majority of people who had COVID-19 on a clinical trial to work out what worked and, and what didn't, and very, very quickly demonstrated um, uh, that hydroxychloroquine didn't, didn't work, much to the uh, annoyance of a certain uh, national leader in a different country, uh, and, and that the use of a steroid readily available called dexamethasone led to a 30% reduction in mortality for those uh, suffering from COVID who are on a ventilator, 20% reduction in mortality for those who are on oxygen. And I, I cannot tell you how incredible it is, A, to get a result like, like that um, and having recruited so many people so quickly, but also the way this, this crisis heralded a new attitude of collaboration and people coming together uh, to address some of the hard, hard questions we had to answer. 
But it, well, Mark, just to come back to the, now how I managed to, to get such a, a diverse group of speakers, um, certainly in terms of our sartorial uh, sense, um, was I was embracing, uh, to quote uh, Kirk, absurd ideas. But um, uh, sort of on that, I want to come back because we've got just under ten minutes left, and there are a couple of uh, there, there are a couple of questions. Um, so there's quite an interesting sort of question around uh, introverts and extroverts. How do we uh, you know, embrace the introverts when they, you know, when people do come back to the to to to, to the workplace? And perhaps I might address this to Kirk. I think this that we could also add a, a add a flip side to this. Actually, is that I think the introverts probably have loved lockdown, uh, and the extroverts are probably the ones who've struggled. Um, but Kirk. From that point, I mean, this is a, you know, what we're discussing here really is a balance, isn't it? It's, we're not necessarily going to go back to something, but we're not necessarily, you know, going to go marching full blaze into something else. That it's it's how we strike that balance. Is that correct? So, uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I'll attempt something and try and be concise. Um, so, um, I, I go. You've got to. You got. You know, there's time to think and time to talk. And as a leader, you need to design for both. So I think there's a couple of things that I work off, premises that I work off, which I hope people will at least understand if they don't agree with. Firstly, no one is 100% introvert and an extrovert, and I think that they're 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 potentially dangerous labels. I, I I'm you know I I love talking out loud and figure it out as I go and fly by the seat of my pants sometimes, and I need that psychological safety in the headspace of somebody else to help me bounce it around and and allow me to go there. But boy, do I also need time on my own to contemplate and to reflect and to let things just stay and so on. So we all need a bit of both, and and of course some people are extreme one way or the other. And the other thing I would say is that. I think as leaders, we do have permission. If somebody is one versus the other, we do still have permission to ask them to stretch themselves in the other direction a little bit as well, right? So yeah, me. sometimes I have to force myself to to not just speak out loud and, and take a step back and, and go and think about it so I can come back with a more concise answer. And, and of course, for others, we might have to, you know, sort of be, be a, you know, be uncomfortably excited and share our perspective and you know, because that will help us to re realize that our thoughts have got value and, and you know, without that necessarily being able to dress rehearse them. So if I'm a leader, I just go, that's my guiding principle of any interaction, team meeting, briefing, project work, we're doing one-to-one -one casual kickabout. Am I designing for both? And I think the, the reality is the design for time to think is one that we don't do. So, and the beauty of that is that that doesn't have to exist in the confines of the hour long meeting. You know, set the agenda three days before and give people three days to think about it. Um, and even one of the things I'm, I was um, I'm name dropping, I know, but w working with the England football team and Gareth Southgate and his his PA, actually, who who supports him in lots of his admin work for things like setting agendas. They had a really big difference by just reframing agendas as questions. So rather than here's so they did two things. Firstly, give the agenda to the coaches three days before they can think about it versus the pressure on the spot of the hour. But then even more powerfully, frame those three or four agenda items as provocative questions, because we're more naturally then inclined, as Tom says, when we're going for that run or going for a walk just to let it just stay in our subconscious a bit. So so I think that's the thing. And I could go on with loads of examples, but that would be my thing. Time to think, time to talk. Are you making space for, for both within your, your team's environment? And forcing it on them a little bit as well. OK, so, uh, Tom, you look like you're about to reach for your unmute button. So I, I think Kirk's point about the, the binary sort of introvert, extrovert being a dangerous labor is absolutely dead on. And it comes back to sort of knowing your team uh, and taking time to know your team. And then, uh, I don't know, the, the word curation or curator, I, I'm not sure I'd ever heard outside of a muse, museum until about two years ago. And I think it's the rise of data, data curation, that suddenly curation's everywhere. And you know what you've done with the three of us by luck judgment or beautiful planning yeah, is find three important. different people who who bounce off each other and create a bit of energy and that's a skill you know setting setting people together um deliberately different people together um albeit we don't look that dissimilar i guess um and getting the setting right i, I don't want to start talking about feng shui but but i guess it's something about that 
Um, and every meeting is going to be different. And sometimes you'll have had three days to set the agenda. Sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll have had three years. But sort of seeing all that together and, and yeah, I'm, I'm just going to seize on that word curation. You know, part of leadership and part of followership is being able to work out what environment, what group of people are you going to be able to get that right balance of uncomfortable excitement, to use Kirk's phrase, you know, set people in the right framework to get the very best out of them whatever the circumstance will be, because that circumstance is going to change. So I think that idea of curation, um, bringing things together in the right environment to get the very best out of them, um, which I guess is what, what museums do, but I just never thought about it in that way. I think we've all been used to sort of using the museum vernacular for curation uh, for, for, for many years in terms of bringing things to bringing things together. Uh, there is one, I think we've got time for one more, but uh, more, this actually probably relates to more about the, the, those that we're bringing, those we're new members to teams that are, that are coming. And given that so much uh, of training and what's learned is on is on is on the job, you know how in a virtual environment do you think that we can give those who are who are new to the job, new to their roles, that le that that level of experience that they would have got by being thrown in the deep end on day one of their job. So, 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 James, maybe I'll jump into this because because it, it is something that is particularly poignant to, uh, to 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 healthcare trading at the moment. So, so we you know we have uh, a large numbers of general practitioners, which is what I used to do, um, uh, who who currently are spending most of their time doing virtual consultations and and not doing face to face consultations, and this is their period of training. Um, so, there, so there's quite a lot of disquiet about how that catch up catch up ha happens. I guess there are there are two elements to this. Um, one is that none of us should um, be under the impression uh, that the world is going to return to normal. So, so there's quite a, a number of questions here about you know, when we all return to the office and stuff. There are material uh, differences. There are structural differences in our society for good and for bad uh, as a consequence of COVID-19. So we, we, are, we are not going to go back to some sort of pre-2019 uh, uh, view, view of the world. So, so, so I would strongly argue that the, the jobs that we need to be training people for may well be a blend of um, virtual and uh, in-person. Um, uh, and what that blend is will obviously depend on what the job is. So, so in a clinical setting, it's going to be predominantly uh, uh, in person, um, uh, and, and in other areas, it might be predominantly virtual. But all of us will be some. Will, there will be some measure of, 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 of blend, and we and therefore we need to think consciously around around education, uh, uh, about workforce development, about recruitment, about retention. Given this new world that we are we are we are move, moving to, I, I would you know. Hasten to say it's not going to be, you know, blue collar and white collar workers. This is the world of new collar workers. These are these are different. Thank you, Mark. I need to cut you short because we've got 30, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I need to draw this to, to, to a close. Could I ask everyone to go back into the chat column and to complete there? Uh, a, a feedback survey if you've got if you've got time uh just to say i want a huge thank you to to to, to mark to tom and to kirk i've thoroughly enjoyed this uh it's wonderful moderating without actually having to do much moderation uh so it's been huge thanks our next event uh on this theme is in a couple of weeks time details are on the screen now but everybody thank you very much for your time uh, and we look forward to catching up with you very very soon many thanks take care everybody <laughs>